Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I speak with Spencer Clark, Managing Director of ATS Heritage. Spencer shares his insight into what the biggest pain points are for attractions when they're trying to develop their stories and the ATS methodology that helps bring out the very best experience for your guests. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Welcome to Skip the Queue, Spencer. It's lovely to have you on. Thanks for having me, Kelly. It's taken a while for me to persuade Spencer to come on. I'm not going to lie. I've had his arm right up his back for a while, <laughs> but he's finally here. I've um, relented. Yeah. He has relented, but he might regret it. Right. Icebreakers. What's the worst gift that anyone's ever given you? Who's going to be listening to this? No. <laughs> the worst gift. I'm not so much worse, but once you get like your third or fourth mug, you, you kind of like, you know, it might be personalised and tailored to you, maybe. So they're quite amusing. Some thoughts gone into it, but when you get a few too many mugs, that gets a little bit. Uh, what would you rather? Would you rather socks than mugs? It's... Do you know? What? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting into my socks now. So yeah, yeah, some nice socks would go down a treat. I think. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm with you on this. So this was a Twitter discussion. Um, so uh, the team at Convia sent me some lovely Convia's branded socks the other week. They're great. And I had them on. I took my little picture, put them on social media. And then everyone was like, oh, socks, yeah. We were going to do socks for giveaways. But um, people, you know, everyone said, no, nah, socks are, are rubbish. And I was like, absolutely not. Socks are like low of the list of things that I want to buy myself. So if I get free socks, I'm going to wear them. That's it. That's it. And you get your favourites. Good. No mugs for Spencer. Okay, this is a random one. If you can only save one of the Muppets, which Muppet do you choose and why? Oh, man, that's that's quite a good one. Miss Piggy's a little bit hectic for me. I don't think I could, I could you know, spend a lot of time with her. The chef's quite entertaining, though. The hurdy-gurdy chickens, I think, is, uh, you know, yeah. I think he'd he keep, keep a smile on face and, um, you know, yeah, I like a good chef. So, yeah, I'd keep him. That is it's a good choice. And I, and I wasn't even I wasn't expecting the impersonation either. Impressive. Yeah, there you go. Really, we're taking this podcast to new <laughs> levels, people. <laughs> All yeah. right. Can, this one would be quite easy. If you could only listen to one album for the rest of your life, what, what would it be? Oh, that's a good as well. That's really good. So uh back after uni, nineteen ninety nine, I went travelling with my best friend and we had a little camper van and we went around New Zealand for four weeks and we bought two tapes when we landed in Auckland and we had those two tapes and we listened to just those two tapes for four weeks in a camper van. And uh, one was Jamiroquai Synchronised album, uh, big JK fan. And the second one was um, Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Both excellent. And I can still listen to them over and over and over again now. I think I'll let you have the two because they that's a good, it's a great story and really good memories attached to those two. Uh, oh, every time we put it on and there's, you know, I can just hear, it, you know, Dave's not a great singer, but he's, it's a memorable voice he has. So, you know, when we're travelling around... I, these tracks pop up and I'm, I'm taken straight back to, you know, a certain lovely mountain or a hill in New Zealand. It's dulcet times. Thanks, Dave. Lovely. Thanks, Dave. Good memories. Good story. Good start to the podcast. Right. Um, what is your unpopular opinion? So it's QR codes, but in a particular setting. And that is where in restaurants or places to eat where the QR code is that's your menu, it's the way you pay and everything. And I, I think just sometimes it gets a bit, it's just a bit frustrating. It's not a great experience because you, I like a big menu, you know, not necessarily with pictures on of the food. I don't need that, but, you know, a, a good menu with, with everything on it so that you can kind of see the choices. But on your phone, you can't really see the whole menu. So that that's a bit annoying. And then you've got to just order it and add it to your basket and then you think it's gone and then do all the pain. I don't know, it's supposed to be easy, but in that environment, I prefer just chatting to a, you know a waiter or a waitress and just having a good experience 
I agree. Like when there was a need for it, it was great. Obviously, during pandemic times, you know, that was great that that you could go in and you could do that. But I, yeah, I want to ask questions. I want to ask, I want to ask, like, what? I can't decide between these three dishes. What would you, what would you pick? You want that conversation, don't you? That's the whole part. It's all part of the experience of eating out. It definitely is. And I did, you know, I did a lot of time as a waiter in my uh, late teens and early twenties. And, um, you know, a great waiter makes you night, you know, that's the way I see it all your day. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, underused. You don't want to cut them out. You don't want to go just all, all on the app, so, you know. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Right, listeners, it's a good one. Let me uh, let me know how you feel. Are you up for having a little chat with your waiter stroke waitress or um, do you just want to go QR code, cut them out, no, no chat, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All sometimes, right. sometimes I have those moments as well, of course. But overall, I'd rather chat to someone. All right, tell us about your tell us about your background before you got to ATS because it's it's quite it's not it's not in the it wasn't in the attraction sector, was it? No. So ATS, where I'm at now, I've been eleven years, and this was the first first entry into attractions culture sector. So, so I did product design at uni, and I was never going to be the best designer it worked out but what I love design and I love the process of essentially you know being given a problem and and find ways in which you can design something to solve it in the best possible way so so design was definitely in in my interests and then after uni I had an idea my my sister's uh, profoundly deaf and so we had an idea for some software or I had some ideas for some software uh, that helped communicate with businesses using your PC. Um, and this is pre messenger and pre WhatsApp, all of that. Uh, so it's kind of when you're using modems, if anyone remembers those, I'm really showing my age when talking about modem dial ups. Um, and yeah, I went to the Prince's trust actually for a bit of funding, a bit of help and, um, kind of did that startup. So that was inspired by trying to find a, a solution for, for an issue that my, you know, my sister was facing, but then, yeah, the internet really hit us and we had messenger and, and, you know, Thankfully, communications for deaf people are, are far better now and, and on almost any, any cool playing field. You know, we've got WhatsApp, texts, all of that sort of stuff and, and email, everything. So it kind of leveled it a bit. Then we had another uh, set up another business with her and it was uh, deaf awareness training. So we would train healthcare professionals predominantly. So front of house healthcare, how to um, communicate better with, with deaf patients. Yeah. Um, again, driven off of a pretty horrible experience that my sister had and so yeah trying to solve something and make an experience better was really really important to us so that was really good and and through that I I I, funnily enough I met ATS along that route because ATS were looking for some sign language tours they were the first company to really start to do it on handheld devices and um, yeah that's how I met them because they they found us doing deaf awareness training and signing and, and asked us for some help and that that was the the seed but then at that same time when i was doing small business uh consultancy so around childcare businesses um really random but it was the same sort of thing i love working you know a bit of entrepreneurial spirit in me and it was kind of i loved helping organizations smaller businesses particularly with their cash flows and their marketing ideas and and just general small business help really um yeah and then I found ATS and that's a whole other story. I I love that. Yeah. Well, great story. I didn't realize that you'd, you know, had a startup and you've been part of all these quite exciting businesses and that, that it's those businesses that kind of led you to ATS. Yeah. Yeah. I had a a moment and as many of us do, I suppose, and I was, I was getting married and I was working in these, in these different jobs and I was quite, um, you know, it was quite random. You kind of moved to different things. And I was trying to find the, the focus and go, well, what, what do all these different businesses and these things do? And I was kind of looking at what I enjoyed, what I was good at. And um, and I, I went through a bit of a career um, uh, career reflection and, and had someone help me do that. And we were looking, so, okay, well, what's the common thing here? And it was creativity. It was working with people. It was definitely small business, not big corporates. And, um, and at the time, because I'd already known ATS through doing some of the sign language stuff they went on my list as oh I need to have a chat with Mike about that one day he was the he's the founder 
of ATS. And um, and then, yeah, it, it, it eventually we sat down in a chat and he invited me on board to try out. And um, that's 11 years ago. And that's 11 years ago. So what? So tell us about ATS. Tell us what they do for our listeners and, then, and what's your role there. Sure. So I'm now managing director at ATS. So I've been there in that role for uh, two and a half years now two two three um prior to that i was business development and sales director um so driving new business and yeah so ats we we've expanded out now but i guess we we're a full service from creative content so predominantly known for audio multimedia guides so on-site interpretation and storytelling so uh, our core business is around coming up with brilliant stories working with our clients to write scripts and then looking at the creative ways in which we can tell that story to their their target audiences so whether it's families adults overseas uh we then come up with all these great ideas and whether it's audio or multimedia with film or apps with interactives and games we try and find all the you know unique ways of telling that story of that unique site so we have predominantly you know, in-house fantastic production team editors filmers developers we have interpretation specialists and script writers so once we've done all the content we've also got all the technology as well so part of our business has uh, we manufacture our own hardware so multimedia guides audio guides um, we have software that runs on all of them we also do apps and pwas uh, and we have a tech support team as well who are out managing all of our clients so we have forty-five thousand devices out in the field at the moment so there's a lot being used a lot of experiences being had on on one of our <laughs> devices but you know they all need battery changes servicing all that sort of stuff so we've got a tech team for them as well so and complete end-to-end -end from consultation content hardware support yeah and great sector to work in you talked about developing stories heritage organizations have the best stories right so it is an absolutely perfect fit i, I really want to talk about I want to talk about the process that you go through and how you make that happen for the for the heritage sector. What is the biggest pain? So I'm 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 in the marketing team of a heritage organization and I've got a pain and I know that ATS can probably help me solve it. What is that pain that I bring to you? There's a number that we we get approached about and I guess the first one though is we've got great stories so yes heritage and cultural sites naturally have loads of great stories so the the most prime problem really is them to say we want to understand which audience we want to tell our stories to number one and then number two once we know that how do we tell the stories in the best memorable entertaining educational way so really they're the starting points uh, really is helping them understand who their audience is and then going Right. How are you telling that story? I often say with a with a creative conduit between the site and its heritage and their audiences. And we're the guys in the middle. We go, right, we're going to understand these really, really well and come up with really great ideas to tell that story to that person in that experience. And that's the prime, too. But then it expands out. Because once you start chatting to them, you're going, well, those stories can be told in different ways to different audiences, but also the experiences are very different across site to site. So you could have, you know, a linear tour. So you kind of know that the story has to make sense to stop after stop. And it's kind of a narrative thread, whereas other sites are random access. So you're moving around. And so therefore yeah. everything needs to be make, make sense in that situation as well. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't yeah. it? I hadn't thought about how the building itself or the, the, the area itself can have an influence on how the story is told. Absolutely. So, you know, we do guides at St. Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey. And you're thinking, right, big, big ecclesiastic sites, you know, they must be very similar. But they're not. St. Paul's is um, what we call, you know, random access. So once you've done the introduction, you can go wherever you like in St. Paul's and access that content, the storytelling within that space, however you like. Westminster Abbey is very linear. And so you start at point one and you have to go through and there's a, a fixed route to it. They're two very different buildings architecturally. So the challenges with that, for example, is when we're designing the scripts and designing the experience is saying, well, what is the visitor journey here and where are their pinch points? 
I think you know, in, in one spot in Westminster Abbey, we had 10 seconds to tell us, <laughs> tell a story. You, you know, people can't stay more than 10 seconds in that area because it just ends up wow, backing yeah. up and it, and then it's awful for everybody else. Whereas St. Paul's is very different. You've got a lot more dwell time and a lot more space that you can sit and just listen. So two very different experiences that we designed. Yeah. That's really complex, isn't it? So you're not only thinking about how to tell the story in the best way to fit with the venue and the access and how people walk around it, but also from a capacity perspective, people can't stay in this area for longer than 10 seconds. So you've got to get them moving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. It's blowing my mind. How, what, how, talk me through your methodology then, because I think that's that's quite interesting. Like, how do you start this process? Someone, uh, we've come, they've they've come with the pain. You know, we we've got this great story. We're not telling it in the best way that we could. How can you help us? Where do you start? It's a good place. That what we love is you, know, it, you get face to face and you walk the current experience, and you you walk through it and you have. It's great to talk to visitor experience teams, curatorial visitor experience. Um, uh, front of house, as well as senior stakeholders, and having a conversation with all of them to kind of really get a sense of what what's the outcome. Yeah, I'm starting with you know, well, you know what's wrong or what do you want to be better? What do you want this outcome to be? And then we kind of work backwards because you know we we have a lot of experience to share, and so there's things around this routing, wayfinding, dwell time. Um, there's things around. Uh, operations and logistics of handing out hardware or promoting an app if that's if that's what what clients are pushing out uh to their visitors but then they're also you know we get a feel for everything so but we all got to understand you know there's lots of different models as well so some sites for example you may pay to get in but then you may pay for an audio or a multimedia guide or an app afterwards so you're paying for your ticket and then you've got a secondary spend for for a guide um I have to say a lot of our sites, especially, you know, some of the bigger ones, they have uh, an all-inclusive. So you buy your ticket and you get your guide included. But those two models means two different things because on the all-inclusive, the majority of your audience are getting that guide. Therefore, that story that we're going to create for you is being told to the biggest you know, proportion of your audience. You know, Whereas those who buy additional, you know, the take-up is going to be lower. Um, therefore that message is not going to get to that many but you don't need as many devices and so we look at kind of whether they can handle a stock you know of, of hundreds or thousands of devices in some cases so oh, yeah you mean like where they're going to put them exactly yeah oh yeah, yeah i got, thought yeah. about that <laughs> the, the, you know these, these castles and yeah these castles and heritage sites didn't really you know they weren't designed to hold not, not racks so and racks of guides but um which is why they end up in some funny places sometimes you know moat houses and <laughs> whatever you know so uh yeah so we start there that's, that's kind of walk it through try to list yeah we want to listen and understand what everybody as a stakeholder what they're wanting from it but then we really kind of go, what does the visitor really need and want what are they paying for what are their expectations and how can we leave you know how can we have our impact on the visitor experience which is essentially what it is you know we we're involved with um storytelling content visitor experience and technology essentially the delivery method of it what's a good case study then that you could share with us i guess the proof of the pudding is in people being engaged with those stories so it's, it comes it'll it'll be about the feedback right that that organization gets once you know people have been through the the, the experience and they get good travel you know trip advisor recommendations and all that kind of thing what what's a what's a good example that you can say, share with us of something where you've worked on it and it's made quite a vast difference to that experience I'd like to say every single project. We generally want, you know, every client, we want to, you know, we, we're passionate about making a difference. You're investing in time and money and, you know, we want to add as much creativity to it, but we want it to be as effective as possible, which is why, you know, I really want to understand what clients are wanting to get. If we, you know, if we look at this in a year's time, what do you want to see happen? And if it is, you know, better TripAdvisor does that, I, I, I think we're, we're hitting that really well because not many sites, I'd say, you know, you have have visitors kind of commenting on the audio or the multimedia guide, you know, back in the day. It's, but when you look at a lot of our client sites, they're getting mentioned in TripAdvisor on, you know, and how it's how it's made a massive difference. So um, I was chatting with a, a client today. The guide is eight years old, a multimedia guide. We did a 
full film production for the introduction film but then we also put that content into the guide so that it felt like this really uh, the, the continuity in the storytelling so once you arrive you watch the film you've got the characters on the film um, but they also feature in your guide so as you've watched it you then go off and you go to a dinner party and we we're just chatting today and they say you know eight years on and it's still really, really good and getting referenced to. And we've got we've got, you know, prospect clients and new clients who go over and, and check it out. And they they just love it just because, you know, we've designed it to last a long time. It shouldn't date, you know, because it's often our sector, you know, they're not refreshing content like that every couple of years. It needs to last as long as it can and, and get its money's worth. So, you know, the the output is a great visitor experience hopefully we're inputting on the nps score so hopefully you know people are saying yes the overall you know we're one part you know my colleague craig he says it all you know people don't go to a site for the multimedia guide right they're not <laughs> they're not going you know oh we're here ats are great so so oh, let's definitely go to one of their sites they don't they they go there and then once they get this wonderful experience with the front of house with a fantastic audio multimedia guide that's been thought about and really designed well and then the retail was great and the, the you know the, the food and beverage was good and there was parking and, and whatever and it was a sunny day because if it's a rainy day everyone has a really bad oh, experience because yeah, it's of raining course. so which is obviously out of control of many sites uh so yeah it, you know it really we're one element but an important one we feel uh that that really impacts on on mps and and, and trip advisor and feedback and repeat visits do you uh, do you get asked that question actually about how long you know this will last? So you said that 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 guide has been around for about eight years now, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's that's good, that's good going, that's good return on investment, right? Um, we get asked that quite a lot about websites. You know, what's the re- you know how long, how frequently do you need to update your website? You know, how 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 frequently do we need to go through this process from you know redesign and development? And I think you know it. I think it really depends on how well it's been done to start with. So we've we've worked with attractions where we did their website like six or seven years ago. It still looks great because it was thought out really well. It was planned well. The brand was in place, you know, and it's the same, I guess, with your guide. You know, if you if it's done well from the start, it's going to last longer. Absolutely. It's um, and and to me, that's that, that's a that's part of the brief. That's the design mm-hmm. process, looking at the brief and the clients, you know, and asking those questions. Well, you can update this in a year. It's kind of no, they're not going to update it in a year. But so, how long? What's the shelf life of this product? What do you What do you want it to last? And so, once you know that at the beginning, you start producing it in a way that you say, well, that might date. You know, you could have you know contemporary fashion, but that might look a bit dated in five, six, seven years' time. Whereas if we go animation, <clears throat> you can make things last a lot longer. But then, yeah, realistically, you could be looking at. You know how long does these last? Like eight years, nine years. We've got clients up to ten years now, and and as long as you write it, you know, you, you have an awareness that you don't mention potentially people's names who work there because they may move on, and maybe even the job title might change. So you've got to just be a little bit careful of, of kind of mentioning that, um, especially at sites. You know, consideration when you've got twelve, thirteen languages, you make one change mm. in the English, you've then got to oh. change all it. So so again, it's this this understanding at the beginning saying well the risk of having a celebrity or whoever you know if, if they you don't want them and they're out of favor yeah. or, or whatever or, or you know they, they're not available to do any re-records you've got to think about that and say well that's going to have a knock-on effect and that will change then eventually so yeah there's all these little um you know little little secrets of, of the way in which things happen but we're aware of them and that has a massive impact on on the cost down the down the line but that's quality, the yes, that's the benefit of the consultancy approach that that you take as well isn't it is that you are asking those questions up front and you're thinking long term about what's best for the organization not what's not what's necessarily best for you <laughs> you know hmm. would is it better for me if they update this every three years or every eight years you know but you know you, yeah. you what you want is to get them the best experience from it and have the the best product possible so you ask all the right questions to start with absolutely and and sites are all different you know you, the story at one place might not change but they might have a different view on it um and so or a different angle coming in or there's a different story or theme within that place so you know we did uh, N- uh Noel, uh national trust site so we did their um they had a big conservation project and so we've done the restoration conservation story 
they've come back to us a couple of years later and now we're looking at different stories within them and telling story you know very much around female stories at, at the house as well so we're bringing that in and what we can do we're going to layer it and put it in in with the content so it will start to really you have this lovely kind of layering of, of story and content that people can dip in and out of depending on what they're interested in but that means it, it is evolving but you're not re-recording loads of other stuff you're just starting to to build up on this this nice kind of um, collection of, of content but then you've got sites such you know that you know they're going to have temporary exhibitions every year so Buckingham Palace, we do their permanent tour, but then the exhibition changes every year. So we'll be going in there and, and write, rewriting content just for that that element of it. So yeah, it's most places don't change a lot of their content, but when you do, you, it's usually just elements of it or adding languages or adding an access tour or something like that. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. I love it. But actually, what we're trying to do is just make something better, and that doesn't always mean that you have to spend a shitload of money on making something you know you know what I mean you don't have to start from scratch you can make yeah. something really great with what you have so you know we've been talking a lot with attractions about just making what they have better they don't need to they don't mm-hmm. need a new website right now what you could do is just add these things in and that would make your website 10 percent better than it is now amazing right you've saved yourself a lot yeah. of budget but you've still got this brilliant project and that's the same with what you're talking about you know it's not a start from scratch it's just building on and improving what you have and that's a really good, that's a good place. It's a good offer to have. I, I think it is because sometimes you just want a little refresh and actually, you know, it, it just feels slightly dated or that's not, you know, that's not the language or the tone we use completely. So we just want to change this intro. Mm. Um, and that, and often the introduction is the beginning of the experience. So if you can tweak and change that, that can actually set the tone for the rest of it anyway. So yeah, yeah. I think it's, you know, we, we often go and say, well, what have you got and what, what improvements do can you make on you know on a minimal budget you know and that's the honest conversation you have early on and you're going you know what yeah. what what do you want to happen you know realistically what are your budgets what's your time scales and then we'll 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 come back to you with something that's tailored to you and see what we can do and often a yeah a review of the ex- current experience and we'll be constructive in we think you could Im- just improve these bits at the moment so, yeah. yeah yeah i love that approach um and also do you have a moat house that you can keep all these devices in <laughs> and while we're on the topic of that Let's talk about um, something that you you mentioned earlier, which is this app versus devices debate. So you 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 know you mentioned, and I hadn't it hadn't even occurred to me. You know, do people have the storage space for all of these you know devices? Are they going to be able to put them somewhere? Um, and I get I bet you get asked this all the time. You know, isn't it going to be better if we have an app because people have got that phone in their back pocket all the time, and so then you don't necessarily need as many of the devices as you might need. There's quite a big debate around this at the moment, isn't there? What's your What's your take on it? Well, of course, I've got my opinion on this one, uh, <laughs> Kelly. But you know, th- these questions when I joined the sex, so I joined eleven years ago. Um, and I started going to the conferences and the shows and the exhibitions and, um, you know, apps were around um, and it was the, oh, yeah, they're going to be the death of the audio guide. So there's me joined a company thinking, oh, OK, awkward. I wonder how long I'll be around for, <laughs> you know, but what 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 history has showed me is that it, it what drives a really good product and a good solution whether it's an app or a device, is really understanding those outcomes and visitor behaviours. And COVID was obviously a, a point in time where, you know, people weren't touching things and uh, And it was a kind of a, it, it was a concern at the time, like, okay, well, I wonder how this is going to play out, but we've got devices as well. But what we found is humans fall back into and ease of life and convenience and quality, I think, is is kind of where, I, you know, people say, oh, no, they won't use devices anymore and they won't use touch screens. And I remember, you know, chatting with um, Dave Patton from Science Museum and he said, yeah, in, in COVID, we turned all the all the touch screens off. But everyone kept going up to them and touching, <laughs> touching them because they thought they were off to turn them on. So, you know, they turned them off so that people wouldn't use them. And, and actually what they're doing was, was touching that device more. Um, and, you know, do you remember the days? I mean, people were wiping down all the trolleys mm. and, you know, um, but I, you know, I, I'm quite an optimist. So I was sitting at the time, going, you know, 
once we're past this and through it, I feel we will kind of fall back into, you know, to, you know you're not going to take your own cutlery to a restaurant, are you? So that hasn't happened. <laughs> and, and QR codes are less and less visible on uh, those those restaurants. So that's QR good. Codes. Yeah. So what it really is about for us is, and I, I touched upon it, there's a few things around why, you know, ultimately you can do everything our multimedia guides or audio guides can do pretty much on, on one of these. But for a number of reasons, visitors aren't necessarily, you know, going straight over to these and dropping dropping the hardware. You know, if I rock up with my my kids, got two kids, they don't have phones, and um, you know, so they're not going to download an app when when they get there. My phone is my um, it's my car key, it's my travel, it's my wallet, it's everything. So I'm using it all day, and there's you know, there's obviously battery concerns there as well. So you kind of start getting kind of you know battery anxiety of of that where you carry around a charger, but. There is something, and the more and more we, we we work with clients and we compare, you know, we put apps in places as well as multimedia guides or audio guides, and we look at the take up and we look at the the behaviour of visitors. And even more recently, you know, we're doing a a, a site at the moment. It's got a temporary exhibition for six months. I'll be able to say a bit more about it once we've done the end of the review. But essentially, we've had kind of A/B testing and looking at how the take up is for for guides versus versus apps. Um, and we're positively seeing big demand for devices for a number of reasons with the audience type um, who were there. There's the quality as far as I've paid my ticket, especially on the all inclusive, I get my guide and it's really well designed. And, you know, this is part of the experience It's designed for it. I'm not worrying about battery and the headphones are in there. I haven't got people walking around with audio blaring out because they've forgotten their headphones, which is really annoying to all the other visitors that I've been to a few museums and seen that and heard that. And it's, that's, yeah, it's, it's not a great experience. But yeah, there's definitely a quality thing there about, you know, it's part of, you know, this is part of. Do you think it's it's part of it's escapism as well? So, like for me, I, I'm I'm terrible with if we're out and about. If me, you know, my little girl and my husband are out for the day, my phone's in my bag the whole time, and I for, I forget to take pictures. You know, I forget to tell social media that I've been to a place. Oh God, uh, or oh, what I've ate for lunch because I'm too busy <laughs> doing it. And I think like with the with the kind of headsets thing, there's an element of escapism there, isn't there? Where you don't have to have your phone. Like I like not having having to be on my phone. You know, I like mm. that for the whole day. I've had such a great day. They haven't even thought about looking at my phone. You know, so mm-hmm. I don't know whether there's an element there of don't need you know we're, we're so tied to our phones all the day aren't, all day aren't we for work and things you know I don't need it right now I'm just going to put these headphones on I'm going to escape into a different world where I don't need to think about it yeah I you know don't get me wrong you know there, there's definitely a place for apps and there's a use for them which is why we we have you know we've developed a platform that that, that makes apps as well but it, the devices and uh, you know over this recent exhibition I'm just learning more from visitors and and the staff who are there and they're saying yeah you take your phone and you might have the tour going but i don't turn my notifications off so i'll still get interrupted by things and you're right it's that almost you know i want to be in this experience and i I want to you know my attention i'm hoping is mostly on on what's there and and the stories that are being told to me so yeah there's there's a lot around there there's also perceived value i did a talk at historic houses pre-covid but I had like 160 people in the uh, Alexandra Palace, and I asked them all, "How many of you have just have downloaded an app in the last, you know, in the last 12 months?" A few hands put up, you know, and then um, said, "Okay, how many of you paid for a, an app out of those?" And all the hands went down, and and so you saw, you know, there, there's this thing about would you spend five pounds on an app? Probably not a lot of people would. Um, it's got to be really well promoted and maybe in the right circumstances, the right place, the right exhibition, you, you, you'd get someone doing that. But people will pay, and you see it, they will pay £5 for a device that's you know, been, been designed and, and put in there as part of the official experience of this of this site. So you've got to look at the take-up and the reach that, that an app will bring over a device as well so there is perceived value so if you can charge for it great or if it's in ticket price it just makes the whole value of the experience even better i'm not sure what's your experience when's the last time you paid for an app kelly it's a good question as you asked it i was thinking and i can't remember i think there were there, there must be something that i've paid 
a, like a minimum value for like it was like I don't know 69p or one pound 29 or something like that but I could I couldn't tell you what it was or when I downloaded it I mostly have car parking apps on my phone yeah, that, yeah. That, honestly yeah. I think at one point I counted I had seven different car parking apps on my phone because all of the car parks obviously stopped taking cash and I'm terrible with cash anyway I never have any of that and so yeah I've got yeah a lot of them but they're all free. yeah so yeah so there's definitely something there around around perceived value and, yeah. and what it means to the experience I think yeah it's really interesting actually I, mm. yeah I would, the debate I the would debate pay. will continue for years though Kelly the debate will carry on you know and if that's about you know, telling the telling the story, a great story to as many people as possible, right now, in our view and our our data that shows across all these sites, is is devices are, are are doing a better job than than apps at the moment. But but there's still a choice. There's still you know some people will have them, and you know I think it's going to be a blend. It's going to be a blend, but overwhelmingly well, devices at the moment. But it's interesting because you mentioned, uh, and one of my questions is like, how is ATS evolving? Because I guess that you didn't always have apps as a as an option for people so that's probably one of the way ways that you've evolved over the years right yeah so we started doing audio guides you know that was the the initial and then again i said yeah mike the founder was really he spotted you know multimedia as an opportunity you know screen devices as we started coming through not everyone had smartphones at that point um and so to provide a screen device it was great for putting additional content and film content and um and also accessibility, you know, sign language videos and things like that, which is how I got into into ATS, you know, it was a sign language video. So putting them on a screen and, you know, you look at how much audiovisual content we now all consume on a small <laughs> handheld device. You know, it's uh, it, it was de- he definitely saw something and, and that's where ATS kind of drove that 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 element. You know, a lot of our work was multimedia guides uh, over audio guides. And it was about not just playing audio with an image on the screen, because that's not adding much for the sake of this device. You need to add a lot more to it. And that's where we grew our in-house, you know, uh, product production team. So all the editors coming up with really good ideas and animations and videos or, you know, interface designs, all that sort of stuff that, and, and interactives and games and things like that. You could be really just opened up a whole world of opportunity really yeah so we so we started pushing that but again you know it, it, part of that design process was i'm going back to the kind of you know we only had 10 seconds to tell this story where it's the same with these devices and when we're creating content visual content is it's got to warrant the visitor's attention you know if you've got an amazing masterpiece in front of you then of course you don't want to be head down in a screen yeah. you want to be looking at it but what could that screen do if anything we may decide not to even put anything on there, just go audio. But there could be something there that you want to, a curator might be interviewed and show you certain details on the painting and you could point them out on the screen that then allows you to look and engage with the with the art in front of you. But yeah, it's, it's um, we, we, we drove that kind of way of delivering interpretation on site through through multimedia guys. But we, we do a lot of audio as well and just playing, you know, straight simple audio i say simple but lovely sound effects really nice produced you know choosing the right voices really good script sound effects that sort of stuff so yeah it's quite a pure way i guess you would say with, with audio only nice uh you mentioned the word warrant back there which brings me to my next question which i think is is fascinating because there aren't many organizations that are ever going to achieve this but um ats has a royal warrant now yeah yeah we got it in march uh 22 so um, absolutely phenomenal tell us a little bit about that yeah so um we've worked with uh royal household for quite well well, on a couple of sites for over 15 years um and we do we provide audio multimedia guides across pretty much all of the raw sites now which um is is a wonderful achievement we're really proud of it um and yeah, we applied for a royal a royal warrant. They're awarded to about eight hundred businesses in in the in in the UK, and they range from one person sole trader crafts craftsman craftspeople through to multinationals um, and SMEs and everybody in between. And it's a mark of quality and excellence in in delivery of service. And 
and, and are sustainable as well. So, you know, over a long period of time. So, yeah, we, we applied for it and um, we were awarded it in March. And it's, yeah, it, it, was, it was a really lovely, lovely accolade for, for us as a business. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, yeah, it was it was a great moment to get. So we've got a hold of that now. So um, that yeah. must have been lovely. So uh, again, at the start of the episode, you mentioned that you'd moved into the MD role. So that, and that was a couple of years ago, right? So you've, you've been an MD through COVID times, which must have been a challenge for you. I mean, I, I, as a founder of a, of a organization myself, I know that, I know that that was a big challenge, you know, having to learn how to do things in a completely different way. That must have been a really lovely, a really lovely kind of success story of those times. D- definitely you know we have got such an amazing team and and one that you know people stay with us you know our team stay with us for a long period of time and it was also a point where i was taking over and and the founder mike was was properly retiring so for him as well you know it was really great to get for him and um we had one made up for him as well a plaque so he can you can have his own so he's got his own rule warrant but yeah for the rest of the team it is a recognition on you know it, what, what's really important for me is that everybody in the team is responsible for for the quality of service that we deliver from you know from picking up the phone on answering the phone working on projects the development team the service team the teams that go on site we've got staff as well so we staff at St Paul's Cathedral and and Bucks Palace and, and Windsor Castle so we've got we've got members of the uh, team handing out guides and operations there and it's everyone's responsibility in our in our business to you know to be to offer a great service in everything we do and and it, it definitely was yeah it was a it was a really great recognition that we could share with the team and um yeah amazing right what is next for ats what what exciting developments are there coming up that you can share with us anything on the horizon yeah i guess this year feels like many and i've been speaking to you know, it's nice to get back into conferences and exhibitions and stuff where you're kind of chatting to to the sector. But this feels a little bit more normal as a as a year. I think last year was still a kind of bounce back out of COVID, but this year seems to be more. You know, there's tenders coming through. Um, people are now doing new projects, um, so that's good to see. So there's an appetite. I, I think what it's really shown is there's an appetite in the sector to really improve the quality of visitor experiences. I think that that's what's really um, that I'm seeing and something that, you know, we're well positioned to to support clients in is, is that quality of, of a visitor experience. So, so on the back of that, yeah, we're, we're looking at always continuing to look at different ways in which to tell stories um, and the way in which we can in, engage with a visitor, which doesn't always mean the latest tech, you know, we we've looked at, you know, AR and and things like that, and we've we've tried it. But what you've got to be careful of what what you've got to understand is, in, instead of when you've got visitors from eight to eighty five year olds, your solution has to be accessible to everybody. And as soon as you might put in something that might, you know, if the technology doesn't quite work in that environment because it's too dark or too light or, or, or whatever, or the tech just isn't there to do it, then it suddenly breaks the magic of that experience, and so you kind of you look at different ways of being innovative and that can just be through a really different approach to the script writing or putting a binaural 3d soundscape in instead or you know having a really good interactive that just in, you know brings the family in to answer questions or something like that so i'd say you know we will always continue to innovate but it's not necessarily about technology but we are we love tech but you've got to think about the practical implications of tech in, in the projects and that goes back to earlier when I said about sustainability and the budget and, you know, some sites, you know, some organisations just don't have the appetite or the budget to invest in some of this tech, even though they see it and they say, we want that. Yeah, OK. Yeah, you know, this, this is how much it costs and it's brand new, so you'd be developing from scratch or, or whatever. And, uh, and it's not always not always palatable with, with the, <laughs> the budget holders. So, yeah, you've got to think about operationally sustainable. What's the best solution that... that, that reaches your outcomes essentially um so so yeah where else are we heading great content we've got uh new new products coming through new devices that sort of stuff which is kind of been like i said our core business but we're also doing a lot more online so digital exhibitions things like that so we're taking our on-site 
storytelling experience uh, and moving online. Um, so we've done, you know, from virtual tours, but not just 360s where you've got hotspots. We we did we add the ATS magic to it. You know, what else can we add into those kind of uh, online experiences? It's a different experience, but um, we can can definitely add some lovely creativity to the storytelling on that. So we did that with a number of clients, including Lenin Palace. We did the Churchill exhibition, which is a full three day film shoot over COVID which was a huge challenge yeah. Um, but yeah 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 there was a high risk factor there when um your main star is a, a Churchill lookalike and if he got COVID the whole shoot was pretty very much cancelled <laughs> so, so yeah but we managed to get through that so that was good so yeah more more of that sort of stuff so looking at the online space um we're getting into um 3D digitization of of collections so we've got a partnership going on where we can we can yeah photogrammetry using photogrammetry to create 3D models and then what we're saying is we yeah, we add the ATS magic to that when you've got that model let's put it in context let's let's tell that story around that that actual object that's a, a 3D model um, so yeah we're playing around with areas on that and some other things that um, I'm sure I'll share in the in the future oh, I look so, forward yeah. to it I'm sure we're not sure. standing still that's for sure Billy. no and I'm sure I'll hear about it at whatever conferences that we're at together at some point as well Spencer and um, we yeah. always ask our guests about a book that they love that they would like to share with our listeners what have you prepped for us today I'm in the car a lot so I do a lot of audio books if anything I don't you know I, I, I don't know if it's an excuse but I just don't find time to, to sit and actually read you know Busy family life, busy work life, all that sort of stuff. But so a lot of audio books, but also in I love business books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever you can learn from kind of business and marketing. And obviously I had that role previous to ATS. I was kind of, you know, supporting small businesses and stuff. So there's one I had a uh, I attended a session by um, a marketeer called Bryony Thomas, and she's got uh, a book called Watertight Marketing. And I just, when I wrote, her session was brilliant. It was really practical. It's really scalable. So it could be for a one person company, sole trader, up to an organization, you know, that has, you know, multiple products online, where, wherever. It was just a really good book that just gave you clarity and thinking. And there's this takeaway straight away from it um, and a really good approach to kind of reviewing your marketing and how well it's working. Um, and then just picking those things that are going to work quickest so finding out where the weaknesses are the leaks essentially she calls them so yeah i i really recommend it anyone most you know yeah i'm hoping quite a lot of your listeners are, are interested in marketing we're all looking at trying to get visitors back in and and what our service and products are so i'd recommend watertight marketing by bryony thomas oh i think that's a great recommendation i've read that book i've met bryony once a very long time ago and it's so simple it's ridiculous isn't it and you think how is this book <laughs> how is this the first book that's talked about marketing in this way that's what blew my mind when I when I read it um and it is it's, it's just about plugging the gaps like filling yeah. the holes in your bucket it's absolutely brilliant concept great book thank you for sharing right listeners if you want to win a copy of that book and I would recommend that you do um if you head over to our Twitter account and you retweet this episode announcement with the words, I want Spencer's book, then you might be lucky enough to win yourself a copy. Thankfully, it was only just one book today. Everyone else tries to kill my marketing budget and goes with two. So well done you, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you ever so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's lovely that you came on. I'm really pleased that you did. Lots to think about there um, and loads of, of tips for our listeners if they're thinking about enhancing their story. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.